150 years ago, this place along the Oregon-California border was a war zone. The first thing you have to keep in mind about the Modoc War is its scale. This is not some giant anonymous war with kings and generals fighting hordes of nameless enemies. Instead, most of the main players personally know each other, and aside from the war, are often on good terms. In less than a day, you can drive to all the different battlefields and locations. But don't let the small scale fool you. This story is an intricate, tangled web of motives and relationships, and one wrong calculation could mean your life. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. They've got an outstanding deal going on right now that I'll talk about later in the video. But first, let's start at the very beginning, about 10,000 years ago, along the California-Oregon border. This high country is rugged, but not impossible to live in. For thousands of years, several native tribes occupied this area between Crater Lake and Mount Shasta. The larger tribe, to the north, was named the Klamath. The Klamath were related to a smaller tribe of several hundred people to their south, known as the Modoc. The Modoc lived in the area around Thule Lake and the Lost River. Lost River is a weird name. Anyways, although the Klamath and Modocs were related and their language was nearly identical, they often saw each other as rivals and were not known for getting along. The first Europeans to enter this area were fur trappers and explorers in the 1820s. There was occasional contact until 1846, when the Applegate brothers blazed an offshoot of the Oregon Trail through the land that made it easier for settlers to pass through. After the gold rush in 1849, prospectors and miners swept through the area, and along with them came ranchers, settlers, and all the various tradesmen and people that make up society. The major boom town in the area was Wairika, about 60 miles west of Thule Lake, with about a thousand people. The rest of the area became dotted with isolated cabins and ranches. Now, most of the 1850s in Northern California and Southern Oregon were marked by a series of small wars between the native tribes and incoming settlers. It was a free-for-all. During the fall of 1852, Modoc warriors ambushed and slaughtered dozens of immigrants along a stretch of the Applegate Trail on the east side of Thule Lake, now known as Bloody Point. In response to this, several men organized posses to hunt the local tribes. One of the men who rode in a posse was a young prospector named Frank Riddle. Frank came from a Kentucky slaveholding family, but left as a teenager when he didn't see eye to eye with his family. Along with other men like Al Woodruff, Frank made a concerted effort to distinguish between the warriors guilty of killing innocent people and peaceful Indians who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Other men didn't bother to make any sort of distinction. The most notorious of these was Ben Wright. After the Bloody Point Massacre, he lured a nearby Modoc village to his camp and offered them food, which he'd allegedly poisoned with strychnine. When his plan to poison the Indians didn't work, Wright and his men just shot him instead. Somewhere around 45 to 50 Modoc Indians were killed during what came to be known as the Ben Wright Massacre. Ben Wright gets killed by a Shoshone Indian a few years later, but he has literally decimated the Modoc tribe. The Modocs, especially the older people, will never forget Ben Wright's treachery. Around 1858, a peace is negotiated between the Modocs and the new settlers, and things calm down. Throughout all the bloodshed of the 1850s, you would think the Modocs and the new settlers would hate each other, but that's not true. Remember, this is a very sparsely populated place. They know each other personally. To say the Modoc tribe was undergoing change is an understatement. But the Modoc are scrappy and adapt to circumstances as best they can. They begin wearing the settlers' clothing, which is more durable than their own. Many of the men cut their hair and earn money working on ranches, making fence rails, and running mail. One of the Modoc teenagers, a gal named Kachkana, becomes fascinated with this new incoming culture. She's known among her tribe for her boldness, independence, and her tendency to speak her mind. In 1862, she meets Frank Riddle, and within a short time, the two fall in love. They get married the Modoc way, with a few witnesses. Future generations will know Kachkana by her more famous name, Wainima. When Wainima's family finds out what she's done, they are outraged and refuse to recognize the marriage, even when Frank honors the Modoc custom of giving a dowry of nice horses to Wainima's father. Gradually, though, they warm up to Frank. Because here's the deal. By all accounts, Frank's actually a pretty good guy. He's honest. He doesn't drink. Hell of a hunter, which may not mean much to you, but means quite a bit to a 19th century Modoc tribesman. And he loves Wainima. Before long, the tribe accepts Frank, who learns their customs and their language, while Wainima picks up English. Among the white folks, she's known as Toby Riddle. Within a year, they have a son named Charka. The family lives in a cabin near the Modoc by the Lost River. Still don't understand why they call it that. 
Around this time, one of Wynema's cousins walks into a photography studio and has his portrait taken. His name is Kientipus. His father had been involved with the massacre at Bloody Point years earlier and had subsequently been killed by Ben Wright. But despite this, Kientipus is able to have a nuanced view toward the white people. Among his own people, Kientipus is a tai, a chief, a leader. He has this quirk the townsfolk know him for. He loves military stuff like buttons, ranks, badges, that sort of thing. This is how Kientipus gets his nickname, Captain Jack. Captain Jack has friends in Ryrika, including the district judge, Alexander Roseborough, and Elijah Steele, a local lawyer. Well, Steele had been educated as a lawyer back east, but this was the frontier. A man has to do what he has to to make a living. So when Steele uses his legal know-how to successfully defend a man charged with murder, he's paid with four head of cattle. So he uses this to start a butcher shop. Judge Roseborough took great care to treat Indians and white settlers alike while he was district court judge. And Steele had been mediating disputes between the various Indian tribes for years. The Shasta tribe apparently loved him. He had a reputation for not playing favorites and for being impartial while coming up with compromises that worked for everyone. So in 1863, Steele is selected to be the superintendent of the Northern California Indians. Time Around out. The- oh, bad pause face. Sorry about that. Don't worry, what I'm about to tell you will be worth the hassle, trust me. This video is sponsored by the good folks over at Atlas VPN. Now, I feel like I can be real with you. I don't really understand technology or how the internet works, but I hear horror stories about massive data breaches at websites, email accounts getting broken into, identity theft. Maybe it's even happened to you. Now, one of the best things you can do to protect yourself is use a virtual private network, or VPN. And Atlas VPN has one of the best. Since 2019, they've helped more than 6 million users worldwide keep their online information secure. Atlas VPN's software blocks viruses, trackers, ads, you name it. It works on all your internet devices with just one subscription. Your phone, tablet, computer, quite possibly your internet microwave or what have you, Atlas VPN has you covered. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Think about it, when was the last time you got anything for $2? You can't even get a cup of coffee for 2 bucks anymore. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Get ready to live your online life securely with Atlas VPN. Now, where were we? Oh, right about... Around this time, a truly terrifying force is unleashed throughout the region. Government bureaucracy. The federal government offers a deal with the Klamath, Modoc, and Yahuskin tribes. Each tribe will move on to a large, combined reservation in southern Oregon. In return, the government will provide enough supplies and food for the tribes until they can get on their feet and be self-sufficient. The Klamath like the idea. The reservation's basically their homeland. But the Modocs are hesitant. They'll have to abandon the land they've lived on for millennia. The Modocs turn to Steele, who they've trusted in the past to handle disputes. Steele writes letters to the powers that be, proposing the Modocs get their own reservation along the confusingly named Lost River. The Modocs even agree to pay taxes, as long as they can live along the Lost River. This river is a huge source of sustenance for the Modocs. It flows from Clear Lake to Tule Lake, but instead of going the shortest distance to Tule Lake, it takes this weird, convoluted route north and west, like it's lost or something. Oh. The problem with Steele's plan is, he's no longer Indian superintendent in Northern California. He just got replaced by a political appointment. And even if he was still in charge, the proposed reservation's in Oregon, north of the California border. He doesn't have any authority there. Finally, Old Shanshan, the chief who had led the Modocs during the 1850s war, says he will go to the reservation and live there in peace. On behalf of the Modocs, he signs the treaty. The rest of the tribe decides to give it a shot, and they move to the reservation in 1864. Almost immediately upon arrival, there's problems. The government offer the deal, and the tribal leaders sign the deal, but the deal doesn't get approved by the federal government for years. This means the government won't release any funds for the Indians. Instead of the promised two blankets each tribal member was supposed to get, they only receive one. Plus, there's not enough food, so they end up having to butcher their horses for something to eat. And that's not all. Remember, the Klamath and Modoc are historic enemies. The numerically superior Klamath begin pushing the Modocs around and taking the supplies earmarked for them. The Modoc aren't having it, and after about a year, Captain Jack leads a good portion of them off the res and back to the Lost River. The next few years pass as sort of a calm before the storm. The Modocs on the Lost River generally get along with the other settlers like they did before. There might be some misunderstandings, but they generally get cleared up. 
The beef that arises is often personal in nature, instead of part of some overarching systemic problem. For example, Abe Ball, a local settler, was known to be friends with Skookum Horse, one of the Modoc men. Skookum Horse often crashed at Abe's cabin when he was in the area. One night, Skookum Horse came by to stay, but Abe wouldn't let him in. Apparently Abe had a lady friend over, and you know, three is a crowd. Skookum Horse wouldn't take the hint though, and the two men exchanged heated words. Even a few days later, they weren't able to make up. Apparently they never did. In 1868, Ulysses Grant becomes president of the US, and as part of his platform, he institutes what he calls a peace policy toward the American Indian tribes. As part of this policy, he replaces the army soldiers who've been in charge of dealing with the Indians with civilians, usually clergymen. President Grant appoints Alfred Meacham, a Methodist, as superintendent of Indian affairs for Oregon. Meacham immediately gets to work correcting what he sees as mismanagement and improper treatment of the natives. One of the issues Meacham has to handle is Captain Jack's band, who've stayed off the reservation this whole time. Meacham goes to Captain Jack's village and meets him personally. Although Meacham gets an icy reception, over the course of a few days, Meacham convinces Jack to lead his band back to the Klamath Reservation, which he does at the end of 1869. But back at the res, the problems with the Klamath immediately pick up where they left off. When Captain Jack and his men cut log rails, the Klamath demand a portion of the rails as tribute. Captain Jack brings us up to the sub-agent in charge of the reservation, who just offers to transfer the Modocs to a different spot on the res. That's not solving the problem, that's just moving it around. After only a few months, Captain Jack reaches his limit. He and his band ride away from the reservation for the last time and go back to the Lost River at the end of April, 1870. While living on the Lost River, Captain Jack asks Steele and Judge Roseboro to help mediate his problems with the Indian Agency. They agree, but tell Captain Jack he has to submit to the people in charge on the res if they order him to. The next year, there's another wrinkle. One of Captain Jack's kids gets sick and he hires a medicine man to heal his child. As is customary, if the child succumbs to their illness, then the medicine man forfeits his life as well. When Jack's child dies, he shoots the medicine man. This is totally cool among Indian law, but among white law, this is called homicide. A murder warrant is issued for Jack, but the army wisely decides to postpone enforcing it while this reservation business is still being figured out. From 1870 to 1872, the sub-agent in charge of the Klamath Reservation changes four times. In 1872, Meacham himself is replaced as Oregon's Indian agent by Thomas O'Neill. O'Neill didn't have the knowledge of Indian customs that Meacham had, and he was thrown into the job at one of the worst possible times. Over the summer, reports come in of Modocs becoming aggressive with the white settlers in the area, demanding rent to stay on Modoc land, forcing women to cook for them when their husbands are gone, and taking horses without permission. It's too much for the government to ignore. They have to do something. At this time, the Army's forces are widely spread throughout Oregon and Northern California. A patrol through the Lost River area interviews some of the settlers, and while some report trouble with the Modocs, others, including Abe Ball and a settler named Henry Miller, say the Indians have been no trouble at all. In fact, Henry Miller is known to never lock his cabin or his supplies up, and says the real trouble will come if the Modoc are forced to move. The summer passes peacefully, since the Modoc disperse from their camp and roam the country like they'd done for centuries before. As summer turns to fall, Superintendent O'Neill receives orders. The Modoc are to be moved back onto the reservation, peaceably if you can, forcibly if you must. Now, the Indian agents have no muscle on their own. They rely on the army to compel cooperation. O'Neill tells General Edward Canby, who's overall command of the troops in the department, of the directive. General Canby wants his spread out forces to unite so that when the time comes to move the Modoc, they can see that resistance would be futile. Meanwhile, the main body of off-reservation Modoc congregate for the winter around the mouth of the Lost River in two camps. At Fort Klamath, the fort commander, Major John Green, receives orders from his superior to assist O'Neill in any way when he asks, but to also make sure he has enough men to do the job properly. On November 26th, O'Neill sends his assistant, Ivan Applegate, to the Modocs to order them back on the res, or at least agree to meet with him. Ivan was a son of the original Applegate brothers, who'd blazed the trail into Oregon. The Modocs immediately shut him down. No, we're not moving, we're done talking. Upon receiving Ivan's report, O'Neill concludes the time has come for the army to get involved. He sends Ivan to the nearest soldiers at Fort Klamath. When he arrives at 5 a.m. on the 28th, the officer of the day, 2nd Lieutenant Fraser Boutel, tells him there's no way them soldiers can go to the Modoc right then. They're supposed to wait until they can consolidate. 
So Lieutenant Lutell is surprised when he's told his company is moving out, alone, in a few hours to bring the Modaks back onto the res. Lutell Company Commander, Captain James Jackson, will lead the operation. He has around 40 available soldiers from his unit, Company B, 1st U.S. Cavalry. The men ride out of the fort around noon toward Linkville, modern-day Klamath Falls. When they arrive there at dusk, O'Neill tells Captain Jackson, Talk kindly but firmly to them, and whatever else you may do, I desire to urge that if there is any fighting, let the Indians be the aggressors. Fire no gun except in self-defense, after they have first fired upon you. Ivan Applegate joins the soldiers as an interpreter and O'Neill's personal representative. The soldiers ride all night in stormy, November in Oregon weather. Along the way, news of their movement reaches around a dozen of the citizens around Linkville, who decide to grab their guns and follow the troops. It might be fun. News of the Army's movement does not reach the settlers closer to the Lost River, who have no idea the Army is making a move. As the sun rises, the troopers halt about a mile from Captain Jack's village on the west side of the river. On the east side, the hangers-on approach a similar camp. One of the Modoc warriors, named Scarface Charlie, sees the approaching men and rows across the river to Captain Jack's village. Charlie fires off a shot, he says accidentally. Others suspect as an alarm signal. Before the Modoc villagers know it, the troopers ride to their village, next to the river, and deploy 17 men in a skirmish line. Captain Jackson sends Ivan in to tell Captain Jack that one way or another, today is moving day. But Ivan can't find Captain Jack. What he does find are the Modoc men, stripping down for battle and each armed with multiple rifles. As Scarface Charlie tells the women and children to lie down on the ground, Ivan runs out of the village, yelling, Major, they are going to fire. Jackson asks Lieutenant Boutel what he thinks, who tells Jackson there's going to be a fight. The captain then orders Lieutenant Boutel to take four men and arrest Scarface Charlie. As he approaches, Lieutenant Boutel knows what that action will provoke. As Lieutenant Boutel would later put it, great minds appear to have thought alike. As Boutel raises his revolver towards Charlie, Charlie aims his rifle at Boutel. Charlie's bullet snaps through Boutel's sleeve while Boutel's bullet clips a bandana around Charlie's head. Nobody's ever able to tell who fired first. But these two shots start a war that will tear the countryside apart. Immediately, the 14 Modoc men pump rounds into the soldiers' line, who return fire. Within a matter of minutes, eight soldiers are hit. But instead of retreating, Lieutenant Boutel leads a charge with the remaining men through the Indian village. The warriors scramble out of the village towards the grass along the river, still firing pot shots at the troopers. One warrior, Watchman, is confirmed dead. A few others are wounded, including Abe Ball's old friend, Skookum Horse, who's shot through the chest. Once the village is secured, Captain Jackson allows the women and children to leave. He figures the Modocs are so beaten they won't fight anymore. He also orders the Modoc lodges burnt down. There are reports that one of the lodges may have contained an old Modoc woman who was burned to death by the soldiers, but there's no way to confirm that. Across the river, the citizens who had followed the soldiers have been looking for some excitement of their own. When they see the soldiers move toward the western village, the dozen-plus men move into the eastern village and demand the Modocs surrender. These men quickly realize they've bitten off more than they can chew. The Modocs have cover from their lodges, while the citizens are exposed in the middle of the camp. A shot is fired, and the citizens run from the camp, shooting along the way. One of the men shotguns a Modoc woman carrying a baby killing at least the baby and possibly the woman. Two of the citizens are killed before they reach the nearest cover, Crawley's Ranch. There, they hunker down while the Modoc evacuate the village. Lieutenant Boutel would later state, the citizens who attacked the Indian camp on the left bank of Lost River were there without order or authority and had no more right for their attack than if it had been made on Broadway, New York. Captain Jackson, with a quarter of his men dead or wounded, decides to march back up the river to the nearest crossing, and consolidate at Crawley's Ranch. He's unable to pursue the Modoc as they abandon their favorite camping ground. Although Captain Jack's band are shocked and more than a little dispirited, he has a trump card he decides to play as his band paddles canoes across the lake. Other warriors have their own ideas of how best to proceed. By the end of the day, more men will be dead. The Modoc War has begun.